of x-rays, and then we're going to start getting into some of the linear systems theory part of the course, because I know some of you have had linear systems theories, and probably in depth, and uh, some of you, it's, it's newer to you, so we're going to sort of give you the basics. But at the same time, um, some of the material I will then uh, refer you to some of the supplementary videos in terms of, uh, because it can take a long time to go through uh, some of the linear systems, how to actually do convolutions and things like that. Okay, But we will give you the basic ideas in the lecture, and then on the homeworks, there will be some suggested viewing of supplementary videos for those of you who want uh, more in-depth coverage of that. Okay. Just to remind everyone, uh, for the x-ray system, it's fairly simple. There's an x-ray tube that gives off x-rays. Uh, it goes, those x-rays go through the patient, and whatever x-rays make it through uh, are then detected uh, with a film or, these days, with a digital detector. So one thing we talked about is that a lot of the x-rays that are actually generated don't actually make it through to the film, okay? So um, in terms of even when they're leaving the tube, these low-energy x-rays, a lot of them just don't even make it out of the, film, the, the tungsten anode. They just get, they don't have enough energy and they have further interactions and so they die off. Uh, in addition, um, because we know that a lot of the low energy x-rays aren't actually going to make it through the body, uh, we don't want to have unnecessary radiation. So there's actually an additional filter that the book talks about where they'll actually put metal around the tube to decrease uh, further some of those low energy x-rays so that the amount of x-rays actually going into the body is even, is even further reduced. And then what actually gets the film, what's actually leaving the body, you, you see a lot of the low energy x-rays don't even make it through, okay? So that's something to consider, especially when we do the in-class exercise, is how many x-rays actually make it out of the body, okay? So last time we talked about attenuation, and uh, the bottom line is it's fairly simple concept. It's basically an exponential decay that depends on the attenuation coefficient and how far you've gone through the object. So the thing that makes x-rays useful is that the attenuation coefficient varies between different tissues. If the attenuation coefficient was the same for all tissues, then there would be no information, right? You wouldn't be able to detect uh, what's different in the body. So uh, by far, the thing that's dense, and so in general, the attenuation coefficient is proportional to density. The more atoms there are per unit volume, the more interactions there are going to be it also de does depend on somewhat the composition um, of the materials. Um, but to first order, density is, is one of the primary determiners. So uh, bone tends to be the most dense uh, object in your body. And so that is going to have the highest attenuation coefficient. And in this curve, it's followed by muscle and then soft tissue or fat. Okay? Uh, and then air uh, has basically is, is the reference and, and assumes that we're assuming basically no attenuation due to air. So um, there are basically um, these different attenuation coefficients. And as you can see, that uh, the bone has the highest attenuation coefficient, especially at 20 keV. But you notice once we get out to higher energies, the attenuation coefficients become quite similar. Okay? So we, need, do, we need, do need to be operating in a zone at an energy level where there are sort of differences in the attenuation of, of the tissues. <coughs> Um, so one of the, the uh, concepts that the book introduces is to give a sense of uh, you know, how much a material can attenuate is what's called the half value layer. Uh, basically, that's just how far you can go or how thick the material can be before the intensity is decreased by a factor of 2, okay? or decreased by a factor of 2. So basically, when n over n naught equals 1 half, we're going to have, that's going to be equal to e to the minus mu, the attenuation times the half value layer, okay? Uh, this should be a, a L, so that's a log, natural log. And so that's just, um, given the attenuation coefficient, you can always calculate the half value layer, and it basically, you can see here, it's inversely proportional to attenuation coefficient, uh, which makes sense. 
Uh, so some these are the half value layers. Basically, um, here we have the half value layer at different energy levels, and you can sort of see uh, at say 50 keV, you only have to go through 1.2 centimeters of bone to be to lose half your X-rays, whereas you have to go through three, three centimeters of muscle. Okay, so that's just a way to look at that. Okay, so let's do a really simple example. Um, this is actually a little more applicable to CT than x-rays, but it actually uh, is probably the, a good warm-up uh, example to go through as we sort of build on the complexity. So here you're asked to plot the intensity profiles along the x-axis and the y-axis. So let's just go through this example together. So for example, this is my x-axis, okay? And just looking at this, this attenuation coefficient is 2, this is 4. Okay, so the yellow's got a lot more attenuation to it. So, um, and plus we're going through much more distance. So just in terms of intensities, um, we expect the intensity to be higher here than here, right? So that's the profile of that, okay? So just without even doing any math, we know that there's going to be less intensity making it on the right-hand side versus the left-hand side. Uh, and then the, the value here is just going to be E to the minus 2 uh, times 2, or e to the minus 4. Okay? Uh, and here the intent, the value is just e to the minus 3 times 4 equals e to the minus 12. So that's going to be a lot smaller than the left-hand side, but just for drawing it doesn't really matter. All right, so that's pretty simple. And then if we plot over here, let's do the, the y-axis. Okay, so once again, now here it's a little harder to know what's going to be higher or bigger, right? So until we do the math, we won't really know. So the extent of the intensity is going to be here. Uh, there's going to be some value here. This is only going to go through two centimeters, right? All right. So this value is going to be e to the minus eight, right? Because it's just two times four. And then here, we've actually got to figure out this one, we have to go through two centimeters of this, so it's going to be e to the minus eight, right, times going through two centimeters of this, so that's e to the minus four. Okay, everyone got that? Okay. So this is obviously going to be less, uh, because it's actually, it's gone through more attenuation. Okay. So that's what we're just looking for when we're looking at intensity profiles. And so when we, when, you, when we get to CT, we're essentially acquiring these intensity profiles at all different angles and then inverting them to, to recreate the object. Any questions on that? Yes? Can you explain what you mean by the y direction? Because it looks like there's two paths in parallel if you're going in y. Oh, right. So the y direction is just imagine x-rays coming this way, right? So and then we're looking at the profile along the y direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So yeah, so here, in this case, we assume the x-rays are coming down here. Whoops. And then we're looking at the profile in the x direction. Here, we assume the x-rays are coming from this side, and then we're looking at what makes it onto the y-axis. Okay. So you'll see the same thing when, we, when you get to computed tomography. So you always imagine the x-rays coming from one side, and you're looking at it from the other side. Okay. Um, so this is just relating things back to contrast. So for example, here you could say, you know, what is the contrast? Local contrast here, um, in this case, we're saying A is the background. And here where you have this little nodule, this thing that's a little different, that's what we're calling our target. And so we're looking at what's the... Um, the difference between the background and the target divided by the uh, background. And so by going through similar math, you know, in this case, the background just is e to the minus mu x, because that's this distance here. And then in the, the target has gone through a little more, uh, a little z increment, so it's going to have slightly different intensity level. And so the difference of those intensity levels uh, divided by the background is what we call our local contrast. Right? Okay. So uh, are there any questions? Okay. 
So that means you guys are ready for your, uh, the first the question that we posed uh, at the end of lecture on Monday. And so for this one, uh, let me open up the poll right now. Uh, so you should be able to see that. So basically, and, and for all these exercises, feel free to talk to your neighbor. I mean, be collaborative, uh, discuss things. It does, you know, this is meant to sort of get people thinking about this. So basically, what is the, you have choices of four different energy levels. What energy level, you're the radiologist, what energy level should you pick? You want optimal contrast between bone and fat. Okay, so take a minute, go ahead and discuss if you want to, and let's see what people think. Yes. Do we assume that all of those energy levels can go through the body? Um, you can assume anything we've talked about in this class, <laughs> including 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that's the actually important thing to think about. Yeah, so as you're designing these systems, you have to think about everything that's going on. So yeah, so that's a good question. Yes. Sure. I'm just scrolling up a few slides uh, at the request of so this is the relevant slide. Okay. <laughs> so just so every, and the slides are posted online in case you need to look at them. Okay. So that's the relevant slide or one of the relevant slides. And then we'll go back to the question here. Okay. So, whoops, where are we here? Okay, about 20 more seconds and then we'll wrap up. So if you have any last minute changes of mind or decisions, uh, now's the time to put them in. There's only a limited amount of people that can actually respond to the um, Oh, okay, so then maybe each pair of two submit one. <laughs> yeah, otherwise we have to charge you guys like 20 bucks a quarter. So for, for the other questions, what we'll do is we'll have people submit questions in Teams and so that when we're actually uh, asking for free response answers. I don't want to look at 60 different answers. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, so this is the current, um, it's changing every minute, but this is the current rankings or the current scores. 25% here, 38% here, 33% here, and 5% here. Okay. Uh, so fairly uh, spread out, and just as a note, this the initial score was 65% for this one, okay? So this went down to 25%, okay? After, I, I think showing that other slide had something to do with it. Um, so, um, so those of you who changed your answer uh, for, away from 10 keV, why did you change your answer? Right, because it's not going to make it through. There's nothing, there's no signal there, so... If you have no signal, it doesn't matter how much contrast there is between attenuation coefficients, there's nothing to measure, okay? So then it's sort of a, a toss-up between 30 kV and 50 kV. And given the information you have, they're both sort of probably going to be okay because you're actually not sure. So, for example, if we go back up to this slide, 
you know, leaving the body, if you, if you took this slide absolutely as, you know, the truth, then 30 would have no, nothing leaving the body, which would indicate it's 50 kV. But this is just one example. Maybe you got a thin person, maybe more things leave. So thir either 30 or 50 would probably be around where you want to operate. Uh, you probably don't want to be at 100 because, as you can see, um, in this case, for, for most cases, uh, you're not going to uh, have anything. 100 kV is pretty high to have the voltage there. So the, 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 the likelihood of someone having cranked up the voltage to 100 is probably not that high. Okay? But it could have been. I mean, someone could have just cranked it up to like 1,000 or something and burned the patient up. And you might have good contrast. But in general, um, uh, you know, 30 or 50, given what you know, is probably a little more uh, a, a good initial guess. Okay? Any questions? All right. So now we're going to sort of uh, start trying to put some math to this, but at the same time, we really want to try to marry the math to the physical intuition. So, uh, and what I'm going to do today, if you follow along, in, when you're doing the reading, uh, they'll talk about things like obliquity factor and, you know, attenuation with distance. We're going to sort of ignore those because those are, uh, and we might come back to them later, but for today we're really going to focus on two things, which is object magnification and source magnification, because those are the two sort of things that are most, uh, that are going to require some new concepts and also give you some physical intuition into really, um, you know, what, what has an effect on your x-ray image. So the first thing we're going to do is magnification of the object. And so the assumptions are this, that we're going to assume that we have a point source for the x-ray, okay? So imagine an ideal point source, okay? In reality, we can't have a point source, but for now, we imagine an ideal point source that's just giving off x-rays uh, in all directions, okay? We have a collimator. Is that us or no? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is a test. No action is needed. All right. So, okay. What does that mean? It's a presidential test? <laughs> For the nation. Really? Yeah, I'm not going to go into that. That would that would be the whole. <laughs> okay, um, great. So that we didn't launch a nuclear thing or anything. Okay, so um, assuming that we're not at war, uh, let's continue. Um, so basically, the the key things here are there's D, which is the distance between your X-ray and your film or your detector, and the other quantity is Z which is the distance between your x-ray and your object, okay? So those are the only, D and Z are the only things you need to keep track of for now. And the magnification is simply equal to D over Z, okay? And so it's always going to be greater than 1, so greater than or equal to 1, so keep that in mind, okay? So what that's saying is it's always going to magnify your object, all right? And so you can sort of think about this relationship. So if I have uh, my source back here, and I think about the x-rays that are going to intersect with the edges of my object, okay, then they are going to form an object of this size here, okay? And um, if I have, if I get my object closer, my source closer to my object, all right, so I move my, as, as, the, as the object moves closer to the source, then the path the x-rays are going to take is going to be a little wider before it hits the film. And so you see that's going to lead to a magnification of the object. Okay? You've all done the same thing with a flashlight in your hand, probably. You know, as you move your hand closer, it gets bigger on the wall. So you already know the answer. Okay? So that's magnification of the object. Uh, these are some examples of that. So here, d over z is probably uh, 2. And so this is like d over z equals 2, looks like it's magnified by about 2. Here it looks like d over z is maybe, I don't know, 3 or 4, maybe 4. Okay, so much more magnification. 
And here d over z is probably, I don't know, 1.3 or something. So it's not magnified as much. Okay, so that's a fairly simple idea, but just uh, going through it so we have it. Uh, so magnification of object is, um, in terms of the math, if we have the intense, so we'll talk about uh, two things. One is the transmission function, t. So the book uses t of x, y to sort of represent how many x-rays the object transmits. And then this is the image, okay? Intensity. And so if the magnification is 1, then my image is exactly uh, the same size as my object or transmission function. Okay? And in this case, m equals 2. Okay? So in this case, what we're saying is my image is now equal to t of x over 2 comma y over 2. All right? And so in general, I, the, the image will always be equal, whoops, I thought I turned off the screensaver. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so we're back. Um, so this is equal to t of x over m, so this is like t of x over m, y over m. All right, so uh, you'll want to get used to looking at things that are scaled because there's going to be a lot of scaling. So, um, you know, the easiest thing to think about is, you know, when you have x divided by some number bigger than 1, it's going to dilate. And if it's less than 1, it's going to shrink it. All right? Let me just turn off the power saving on this. <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah, just just let me just turn off this <laughs> this thing. So, uh, just give me one minute. This is the first time I've used this setup, so it's. Okay, we're gonna make it never. So that's good. okay. Sorry, could you repeat your question again? You mean in terms of like 2 times x? Yes, well, so that if, if n equals 2, then we would have t of x comma y, and we would have i of 2x comma 2y. Okay, that's a great question. Um, you mean, say, i of 2x, 2y equals t of xy? Um, well, I think that the idea is that you want to... Um, in terms of you want to be able to, your eye of xy is sort of like your computer screen, right? And it's got xy coordinates, right? And so you basically want to sort of have that, you want to express what your object, how your object changes within that coordinate system as a function of magnification. Otherwise, you could do it the other way, but your life will get very complicated soon. <laughs> so this is probably, you want to sort of, uh, in general, there's lots of different ways of writing things, and so what people have, you know, what generally you want to always do is go after the thing that's most simple and least confusing. And so in general, you want to just be able to think about, I have an image, and how does this image relate to my object? Okay? Right. Okay, so here's the next poll. Um, given what you know, and let me open up this poll. What is the optimal distance between the source and the object? Okay. So go ahead and feel free to discuss this as well. Yeah, optimal is up to you. Okay. So I have not defined optimal. I have to define distance, and object and source are defined. So uh, you know you can have a discussion about optimality.
Okay, so let's take a look at the results. Uh, so the current scores are 5%, 10%, 43%, and 43%. Wow, dead tie. Okay, so what are the magnification factors here? What's the magnification factor here? D over Z is what? Infinity, right? All right. So... That's good. What is it here? Five, right? And then it's two and then one, right? Okay. So um, infinity is probably not a good operating point to be at, right? Because uh, first of all, think about this. Your object's right next to the x-ray, so it's going to get burned up pretty quickly, <laughs> okay? Uh, the next thing is if, you, if there's any sort of variation in that, the magnification goes between infinity and some other infinity, okay? And so that's probably not a great place to be at. Okay, um, so what about, um, so uh, m equals 5, okay, but why 5, right? Why not 3 or 2 or 4 or 4.1, right? So uh, just sort of logically, if you're taking just a test and trying to logically figure out that you'd probably pick 1 because 1's a nice number, right? There's really no reason to pick 2, 3, or 4, okay? But, I mean, you could argue that there is a reason to pick 2 because 2 is bigger than 1, right? And bigger is always better, right? And then maybe 5 is bigger than 2. It is bigger than 2. Um, so really, there's no way to figure out what's better, right? So let's think about, um, and this applies not so much now, but in the old days, let's say you went back, went to your dentist, and he was kind of trying to keep track of the size of a cavity or, or the size of a growth or something like that. And he was just eyeing it, and he's not, he was not a very careful dentist, right? So he's just sort of looking at it very quickly. And he's either going to pull your tooth out or not, all right? So you, want, you really care about whether he's made a good assessment of the size of whatever he wants to take out. So given that, between visit one and visit two, you really want to make sure that the, the sort of the magnification doesn't change, right? So what would be the best thing to do? To, to make sure that the dentist doesn't make an error and pull your tooth out accidentally. What magnification would probably be the best? Probably one, because that means the object is right up against the film, right? So all he has to do is put the object right against the film, and he knows he's got a magnification of one. Whereas if he picks any other magnification, you know, depending on how careful he is in positioning the object in the film, uh, it's going to have some issues with it. Okay, so in this day and age, we've got digital stuff, and so and you're never going to get the object right next to the film, so it's not a it's not a huge deal. But in general, you'll notice anytime you get an X-ray, you're right up against the film. Okay, right up against the detector, and part of that is just you know if you can reduce variability, why not? You know why just allow the subject to stand anywhere, <laughs> you know, and have variable magnification factor? It's just one one more thing that could go wrong in in the whole diagnosis chain. So. All things being equal, you just want the object right next to the detector. Okay. The next thing we want to talk about is source magnification. And so what that means is, uh, up to now we've assumed a point source, but we can't really have a point source in real life because we're not going to get enough x-rays. So we're going to have to have some finite size of our x-ray 
source, right? So it's going to look something more like this, where it's got an extended width, okay? Now the problem is, and the thing that we're going to look at in detail over this lecture and the next lecture, part of the next lecture, is that's going to have an effect on my image, okay? So here's the bottom line. If I have a point source, I have a really nice clear image. In this case, they're using x-rays to look at an electronic circuit, okay? If I all of a sudden extend my source, now you see I have an unclear image. Okay, I've obviously blurred my image out. So part of our goal uh, over the next lecture and a half is to understand why that happens and how do we characterize that. Okay. So we're going to start off with the simplest case, the simplest object, which is a point object. Okay. So before we assume a point source, now we're going to assume a point object, but we're going to allow the source to have an arbitrary geometry. And what a point object simply means, you know, how would you make it? Well, you could take a big piece of lead, right? No x-rays don't go through the lead. You could just drill a little hole through it, and it's a fairly thin piece of lead, so x-rays can only go through one little hole in this sheet. Okay, so that would be your point uh, object. Okay? So now the idea is, if I have this small hole, if I'm, uh, and here again we have our D and our Z, okay? If I'm here, then the x-rays go through the hole like that, and you can sort of see the size of my, the image of my source is going to be the same size as the image of, uh, as the source was. So if the source was one centimeter wide, the image of the source looks to be one centimeter, okay? As I move that um, thing closer, that point object closer to the film, so here, the distance is much closer. Now you can sort of see, if you look at the path that the x-rays can go through, it's really shrunk in the size of the, of the source. Okay, so the magnification is less than one at that point. All right? So in general, so what you can show is by just geometry is that the size of the image over the size of my source is just d minus z over z. Okay. Uh, so what happens to this equation as z goes to d? What, is it, what does that go to? It goes to zero, right? Okay. Um, and when is that, uh, and the magnification is equal to one, if z equals d over two, then that is going to equal one, right? Okay. So in general, the notation we're going to use, we're going to use little m for source magnification, it's a function of z, which is the position of my object, and it's got this d minus z over z, and then there's this minus sign here, okay, which is sort of annoying, but we sort of, because, you know, these rays are on this side, but they end up on the image on this side, so it actually flips your image, just like a camera, okay? And so, you know, it's sort of annoying to have that, but if you really want to be precise, leave it in there, but it's not really going to affect any of the problems you work on. So the main thing is just knowing what that magnification factor is, okay? And so m, little m of z is equal to 1 minus m of z, okay? All right, so, um, so these are three examples. So in this case, we have uh, m equals minus 1, All right? So let's actually, we'll just have that minus d minus z. So we have, it's minus d minus z over z, okay? So in this case, uh, z was equal to d over 2. So d over 2 over d over 2 is just 1. We have the minus sign m equals minus 1. In this case, it looks like z is maybe equal to, let's say, 0.9d, right? So we would have uh, 0.1d over 0.9d. And so that would be equal to 1 ninth. Okay. So that's shrunken my source. And if z is really small, let's say z is equal to 0.1d, then we'd have 0.9d over 0.1d equals 9. So in that case, it gets magnified quite a bit. Okay? So the problem is that, you know, when you have this point object, what ends up on your film is a picture of your x-ray tube. Okay? And you didn't, you're not going to the doctor to see an image of the x-ray tube. Right? So we need to figure out how to reduce it so we're, not act we're actually seeing our object and not seeing the x-ray tube, okay? 
Okay, so once again, given what we just talked about, all things being equal and not knowing what optimal means, what's the optimal distance? Z between the source and the object for minimizing the effects of source magnification. Okay, so go ahead and then take a look at that for about a minute. And the hint is if the object is a pinhole, what is the ideal image? Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the answers. So uh, A had some early votes, but now it is at 0%. Okay, so nobody likes infinity, uh, so that's good. Uh, this has 5%, this has 45%, and this has 50%. Okay, and remember we're looking at D minus Z over Z, right? Okay, so in this case, what is little m? It's going to be uh, four fifths over one fifth. Is that right? Right. So it's equal to four. Here, with the well, I'm just going to drop the minus signs, but just there is a minus sign. Okay. Here it's going to be one, and here it's going to be equal to zero. Right. Okay. So. Um, so let's look at sort of the, the two most popular votes, which are actually tied right now, 48%. So the votes have changed. They're exactly tied now, 48% and 48%. So we're, we're, we have a probability of 50% of being correct. Okay, so that's good. So, um, so yeah, one is a nice number and zero is also, so a choice between two really nice numbers, right? I mean, one of them has to be correct. And they're both much better than four because, you know, four is just not, you know, one of those important numbers, right? Okay, so um, what is the argument for having m equals 1? So anyone who voted for m equals 1, which is a very good number, what, what is the argument for that? Anybody? Yes? There's no magnification, right? So you see your source perfectly, right? So you see your x-ray tube with a magnification of 1. Okay, great. Okay, uh, who, for those of you who voted and so now the vote has gone from 51 to 49 percent. So, so C is the more popular answer now. Oh, it's going up too. Okay, um, now it's at 53 percent, and D has gone down to 48 percent. Okay, so for the remaining 48 percent who voted for D, why would you want a magnification of zero? Yes. Because you can get any object magnification. Because you what? Yep. Oh, no object. object yeah, right. Object so right. So from our previous poll, we said. That was the that was good for minimizing object magnification, and so we just inherit that that advantage. Okay. Any other reasons? Yes. Uh, we want to minimize the source magnification, so the object zero would be better to the object uh, the two image Right. Right. So that actually turns out to be the, the right answer, which is basically we don't want to see the tube. We just want if if the actual. Um, uh, if the actual object is just a dot, then we just want all the, and then we have our x-ray source out here, and we have the dot here, and our film here, then that's going to concentrate everything onto a little dot, okay? And so that will be the correct, the best uh, representation of our object, okay? So this is, D is the correct answer. So for both object and source magnification, object should be right up against the detector. Any questions on that? Okay. Yes, question. Yes. Is there any version of the image? 
inversion. Um, no, in the limit, yes. Yeah, in the limit, yes. Because we're talking about, okay, so later on this lecture we'll talk about Dirac delta functions, which are ideal functions which don't exist but are useful. So yes, in the limit there would still be an inversion. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay, so this is an example here of, uh, this is a, one of the first medical imaging textbooks that came out by Al Makovsky from Stanford, which was, he's a pioneer in x-rays and CT um, and also MRI. And so this is just showing you the difference between um, here, this was at uh, going to be z equals d over 2, and this is z equals d. Okay? So this was, these, are the, these are basically the two choices we had in our last poll. Okay? And you can sort of see that this image here, it, while it's good, it's not as clear as this image. Okay? There's a little bit of blurring in that image. Um, that, and, and here they've, adju they've adjusted for the uh, object magnification so you can sort of see them on the same scale. But that's basically showing you why, in practice, it's better to have the object right next to the detector. Okay? And so we'll talk a little bit more. This is going to get us into the concept we're going to have to work up towards is convolution. Okay? So that's where we're headed towards. We want to understand mathematically what is that blurring, uh, how do we represent it, and the way we represent it mathematically is an operation called convolution. These are some other examples that sort of give you a more intuitive feel for what's going on. So um, in terms of the blurring, why does the blurring occur? Well, if I have a point source, then you know there's only one x-ray that goes from here to here. Okay. But if I have a extended source, then you can sort of see that there's this thing called the penumbra where, you know, the x-rays that can touch the edge of my source of my object, there's two, there's, you know, there's many paths, but these are the two extreme paths. And so they're going to give this sort of shadow of the object. So sort of this blurring of the objects. So that's what's called the penumbra. And that's also related to our, our convolution that we'll talk about. And you can see here, um, in this case, let's say, you know, here it looks like z is about d over 2, okay? Here it looks like z is about maybe 3d over 4 or something like that. So here, in this case, the, um, this is like m equals 1. This is m is going to be less than 1, right? And you can sort of see here the size of the penumbra has decreased, okay? So, and you would expect as this gets... As this subject moves closer to the film, that penumbra will at some point vanish. All right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, we, we already talked about the impulse response, and what we're working up to now is saying that um, we said the impulse response is the, um, the response of our system to a point object. Okay, And so we just saw that if we have an extended source, then the, that response is going to be an image of my source, okay? And that uh, eventually is going to lead to a blurring of my object. And then the idea is that we want to make, we want to represent images as lots of little point sources, okay? And then that way we can try to characterize what our system will do to any object, all right? So that's where we're working towards. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the, we, we, the other term for this is PSF or point spread function, um, and it's essentially we're going to try to say if I know what the response of my system is to a point source, I can characterize what the response will be to any object. Okay, so that's the claim. Some of you may have heard this, especially if you've done linear systems. If it's new to you, then what we'll do is try to work up the intuition for it. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a detour into some basic notation and, and some basic math that. Some of you have seen, some of you may not have seen, uh, but we'll sort of go through it uh, rather systematically. So uh, the first thing notation we're going to introduce is the Dirac delta function, which is essentially an idealized point source or point object. So in 1D, it's just represented as delta of x. In 2D, it's delta of xy, or sometimes people add this little 2 there. Uh, but in this course, we'll just drop that because it's sort of understood that it's two-dimensional. Obviously, you can go three-dimensional, n-dimensional, uh, any dimension you want. Right. 
And so the idea is we're, always, we're going to use that Dirac delta function as our input, and this h of x will be our impulse response. Okay? And so uh, for an x-ray system, that would just be the x-ray image of a point object. So that's shown here. So this is now we're trying to get mathematically what we mean by this source magnification. Okay. So the source here is represented with this function here. So it's got some width here. So some there's some width to this source. Okay. And basically it's saying that it's zero here and let's maybe say it's one here. Okay. So that's we're representing a source as some function s of x. All right. We're representing our object, so this is the source. We're representing our object with a delta function. Okay, it's got some scaling term here, but forget, don't wor worry about that for now. The main thing is it's just a delta function. And we'll talk about what a delta function is, but just for now, it's our representation of a point object. Okay? And what we just said is if I have this set up, then it turns out that my, um, my image is going to be a scaled version of my source. So in this case, s of x over m. There also is this other scaling factor that uh, comes through, but we're not going to focus on that too much for now. All right. So that's mathematically what we're going to have. So just to represent some notation, um, what we're going to use throughout this course, we're going to use the rect function quite a bit. Okay. So uh, it can represent either with this. Um, this notation here, which, or when we draw it by hand, we might just write it like that. Okay. Uh, it's fairly simple function. From minus to a half to half, it's one. It's zero everywhere else. In two dimensions, it's basically only one within this square, and it's zero. So it's zero everywhere else. So it's zero here, zero here. Okay. Uh, so to, to, to two dimensions, we'd write rect of x, comma y, which just happens to be equal to rect of x times rect of y. Okay, So you want to sort of get comfortable with that and you also want to get comfortable with things like rect of say like x over 2. Okay, Or maybe rect of 2x. Okay, So it looks fairly harmless but it's often a very common source of mistakes so I'm just going to go through it just so we, we've gone through it. So what does rect of x over 2 look like? Well, we know that the, the, the critical point is 1 half. So we say, when does x over 2 equal 1 half? And that's when x equals 1. So we know between minus 1 and 1, it's just going to look like that. Okay. Now, instead of going from minus half to half, it goes from minus 1 to 1. It's 1 there, 0 everywhere else. Same thing with rect of 2x. We ask, when is 2x equal to 1 half? And that gives me x equals 1 fourth. And so that's just going to be this, minus 1 fourth, 1 fourth. It's still equal to 1, though, right? It's just a function. So you have to sort of go back and remember what a function is. And so that's rect of 2x. Okay? So in general, anytime you have rect of x over w, it's just a rectangle of width w. Okay? So that's the easy way to remember. So in this case, here w was equal to 2. So this has got width of 2. Here w was equal to 1 half. This clearly has width of 1 half. All right? So that's fairly straightforward, but it can be a source of mistakes if you go the wrong way. Okay. Any questions? So let's work through this. Uh, we'll just probably do. Uh, so basically, here we're saying, let's 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 do some sort of uh, just so everyone's on the same page. Let's write our expression s of x equals what? So if I have a source that's uh, 10 centimeters uh, in width, it, it's rect of x over what? What's in the denom the denominator? 10, right? Okay? So that's the first thing. So when you're dealing with these problems, the first thing you want to do is just write down what the source is in mathematics. All right? Uh, and then we want to look at, we're just going to focus on s of x over m. 
Okay, so that's going to be our magnified source because we have our point object here. So what is m in this case? It's equal to minus 1, right? Okay, so this is going to be equal to rect uh, of x over 10, and then there's going to be a minus 1, okay? But since rect is symmetrical, that just equals rect of x over 10. Right. So it doesn't do anything, which is what we expect, right? right. Uh, let's look at this one here. So what is little m here now? So you know it's, it's past this halfway point, so it's got to be less than 1, right? So what is it? So we've got z min d minus z is going to be 0.1, right? And then we divide by 0.9, so it's like 1 ninth, right? Okay. So then, and then there's a minus sign, but um, you know, since everything's symmetric, it's not going to really matter. So we have s of x over m is equal to s of minus 9x. Right, um, and that is equal to rect of what? Minus nine x over ten. Right. So, what is the width of this function? So we're basically shrinking it by a factor of 9, right? So the width is going to go from 10 to 10 over 9, okay? So that's the basic sort of uh, question that uh, you need to be able to answer, all right? So let's actually, um, we're just going to do one of these problems. So I'm going to have you guys work on C, and um, let me see how the question is phrased. Okay, so for this one, uh, it says parts B, C, and D, but I just want you to answer, and this is going to be slightly different because this is a free response question. So um, this is what I want you to do. Um, so you go to the poll, and um, pollev.com, b 2 ada You're just going to do part C, and what I want you to do is I want you to, uh, first thing I want to do is, in brackets, put the names of the people in your group. So just work in groups on this. So, you know, it'd be like Bob, L, da da, comma, whatever. You know, just put the names of the people in your group, and then followed by a colon sign. Uh, I, I'm looking for two things. One is an expression for the image in, using the rect function, okay? And then, uh, so give me a rect function with something on the top and something on the bottom, okay? And then tell me what the width is. All right? So should be fairly straightforward, but it's, I think it's good just to have everyone, make sure everyone's on the same page. So just do part C, um, work in groups, and uh, don't hit return until you've entered everything. So don't put your name and hit return. Put your names, colon, answer. So the names and the answers are all together, okay? That's okay. We're just, this is the first time we're doing it, so that's, that's expected. All right, question. Scroll up, like here? Yeah. Okay. Here, what I can do is maybe I'll make it smaller so you can see both of them at the same time. Can you guys see both of those?
Okay, about one more minute, so submit your answer in the next minute. Sure, so just your name, colon, the rect, and then the width. Okay, let's take a look at this. I know some people are still putting answers in, but um, the, the main thing of these exercises is to get you guys to think about it. Um, so then when I do give you the answer, it's if you got it right, that's good, and if you got it wrong, that's also good, because then you can have an opportunity to uh, revise your um, understanding. All right, so let's go through this. So m is equal to minus d minus z over z, right? Uh, so in this case, that's just equal to minus uh, 1 minus 0 0.1, which is 0 0.9, over 0 0.1 equals 9, or minus 9. We'll drop the minus just because, you know, it's symmetrical, but it's, it's 9, okay? So, so we know, even without thinking about it, we know that it's going to magnify my object by 9. So my object has width of 10, so if I multiply by 9, what would the width be? Just 90, right? So whatever I write down, I know at the end the width should be 90. Okay? So even if I'm not comfortable with the math, I know that at the end I can just use my sort of common sense to, to check my answer. And so a lot of this course is going to be, the math is not going to be that hard, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities to get it wrong. And so you need to use your physical intuition to say, well, does that answer actually make sense? Okay? And that's exactly the same thing you're going to need either in industry or academia because there is no answer in the back of the book. So, you know, you're going to have to say, does that answer make sense? Does it make sense that, you know, 
um, this, this distance that I've calculated or this weight that I've calculated, does it actually make sense? All right. So the width is equal to 90. All right. But let's write down the expression. So we said that s of x was equal to rect of x over 10, right? So we have s of x over m is equal to s of x over 9, right? So we just plug in, we replace x by x over 9, so we get rect of x over 9 over 10 equals rect of x over 90. Okay? And that makes sense because we know the denominator is just the width. All right? So you don't have, you don't, obviously once you get this, you don't have to take all these steps, but that's just to be very uh, clear on what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Was there a question there? No. Okay? So once again, uh, a lot of the concepts in this course are actually pretty, um, you know, they're like from high school or previous to high school but it's putting them together <laughs> that can get confusing, okay? All right, so this is an example. Uh, I'm not gonna work through it in detail, but just to give an example more similar to what some of your homework problems would be where you're gonna have a slightly more complicated source. So in this case, it's a Gaussian source. You're given z, and so everyone can calculate what little m is. Okay, just plug and chug. And then the, here's where most people screw up, is basically how do I plug this into this formula? So in this case, I just put in, uh, wherever I had x, I just replace it by x over m. That's all that, that notation means. So instead of x squared, I have x over minus 3 squared. And then that just simplifies to that. All right? So there's sometimes, uh, so uh, for some, some of you may have to just go back and remember what a function is. So a function is basically you put something in, you get something out, right? And so if that thing changes, then you put that thing in and you just replace what was in there before, and, and then you just uh, get this. So that's an example of, of just um, doing that for the magnification. Okay, so we're actually going to work through this together. Uh, in past years, I've made this a problem, but let's just work through this together. Um, now we have our point object. Yes, question. Did you fill out the one just the slide of address? This one? Yeah, so this one, at least for the formula for h, which is, I guess, the output of the function, we have the 1 over absolute value of m. Yes. Uh, and then if you go up to the, like, the problem we just did previously that yeah. we pulled on, yeah. uh, what makes it so that the 1 over m has no role in this case? Oh, okay. The answer is being sloppy. So I, I, I so the one over m should be there. So there should be a so um, so unhappy face. So there should be a one over nine here and a one over nine here. Okay, but I was sort of because I was talking about the width, I sort of simplified it so people didn't get too concerned about that. But yes, you're absolutely correct. It should be there. Okay, in general. Um, and, and in fact, what I'm doing today is I'm, I'm leaving off a lot of other scaling factors. There's other scaling factors due to uh, other things that, well, when we get to the end, we'll sort of get them all together. But in terms of what the image looks like, that's just one number at the end. Okay. And so today we're really focusing more on the geometry. But thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Okay. So let's look at this. Um, so not all objects are going to be on the axis, right? So we need to figure out what does an object look like if we move it off axis? What's the image going to look like? So here I'm at uh, still magnification, source magnification of minus 1, right? Because I'm z equals d over 2. And in this case, we can sort of think about what my object's going to look like. So clearly the x-ray from here is just going to end up here. So my object is now going to start off here at 5 centimeters. The, the, my source image is going to be there. And then this one here, this ray is going to extend like that, okay? And because you go back to like high school geometry, right? I mean, equal, you know, the, these angles are equal, right? Theta and theta, right? <laughs> so therefore, that has to equal that, right? Okay. So this is going to be 10, right? And then this obviously is right in the middle. So this this ray here is there. Okay. 
And so um, this was, um, so this is going to go from 5, so the coordinates here are 5, 15, and uh, let's see now, 5, 10, and 15. Is that right? Okay, so that's what that object is going to look like. Okay, so essentially now we've not only got, in here, in this case, the magnification is 1, but we've also shifted it over the object. How much have we shifted the object over by? 10, right? So it turns out that the expression for this is given as follows. We're going to have a shifted version of my object, okay, of my source. So this is a shifted source image. And um, now the scaling is still the same, so that m factor is still the same. So it hasn't changed the size of my source. But the shift has come in here, right? So let's just take, check and make sure if we got that shift correct on our previous example, which we just did by simple geometry, but now we're saying that the, in general, the shift is represented by m, of x, m times x naught. In this case, we have big M here. So big M here is equal to d of z over z, z is equal to d over 2 in this example. So big M is just equal to 2. Okay, So it's saying take my shift of 2. I'm going to take 2. So m of x naught in this case is equal to 2 times my x naught, which is 5, which is a shift of 10 centimeters. All right, Which is exactly what we derived using geometry. Okay. So this is going to be the general formula we're going to have for any shifted point object. It's going to have a shift that depends on the object magnification, and it's going to have a scaling dependent on the source magnification. So now we've got those two magnifications into one equation. All right. So now what we want to work up to is arbitrary point, arbitrary objects. In this case, I have three uh, point objects. And we're just going to sort of sketch out what that might look like. So in this case, we know that this first object here is just going to give me something like this, right? Because m is equal to 1 here, right? And so this is going to go from minus 5 to 5, OK? We know that this object here, this, the rays are going to go through like this. So it's just going to give me something like that from 5 to 15. And so this goes from minus 5 to minus 15. Okay. So now my total width here is 30. Okay. So what would this object look like? So we have 1 over m, s of x over m, okay, is equal to what? This is rect of x over what? What's on the denominator for this, this object now? So it goes from minus 15 to 15, so 30, yeah, okay. So this is the first example where we're saying, here's an object that's made of different point objects, okay? It's a very simple one, and here the answer was simple. We could just do it by geometry, drawing lines. What we want to work up towards is, what do we do for any arbitrary object, okay? So the first concept we're going to do, we'll spend the last 10 minutes introducing, talking about how do we represent images and objects in general, using delta functions. All right. Question? Yeah, so on that slide, yeah. I don't quite see how this is an x-ray. So the, the thing at the top is yeah. the source of the x-ray, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. And then are there, let's say the things in the middle, are they two? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, how, would I, how would I create that object? I'd take a big piece of lead and literally drill three holes in it. OK, so we're not, oh, we're not interested in this. So there should be something else below that, between that and the, the x-axis, right? Uh, no, in this case, what we're interested in is that piece of lead. That is my object, right? So or else you could think about, you could take a body and drill three holes through it. <laughs> that would be your, so yeah. If we're, uh, if we're 
interested, if that is our object, yes. why are we using source magnification in all of our equations rather than object magnification? Uh, well, there is object magnification here in terms of um, the m is equal to 2, which is was given, which ends up in the shift of my object. So both end up shifting. Yeah, so that's what sort of, there's two things. There's going to be a shift of my object, and the, and which is object magnification, and then there's going to be the source magnification. Those two things are going to get wrapped together to give us our x-ray image. Okay. We'll go through that more next lecture, but today just representing, presenting the concepts. And then we're, what we're working up towards is what's called the x-ray imaging equation that lumps everything together. All right. Okay. Okay. So let me just spend the last uh, few minutes here talking, uh, representing some uh, concepts that we'll then pick up again on next week. Uh, so essentially, when we talk about signals and images or objects, we can have either discrete time or space, or we can have continuous time or space. Uh, I think everyone's fairly familiar with discrete time, which is basically what we all deal with today, which is, you know, everything is digital. And so that just means that we can represent our image uh, using indices of like either n or m of n. And so in this case, at every index n, we have a value of our signal, or in this case, if it's an image, we have discrete points, like one, two, three, four, five, and at each coordinate, we, um, we state what the value of the image is. All right? On the other hand, we still represent objects in the real world, typically with con as continuous time objects or, uh, images or, or, or signals. So for example, my voice, you could say, is a continuous time signal. So it's a function of time where there's no chopping of time. You just assume that time is continuous. Or in space, your body sort of occupies space in a continuous manner, uh, you know, ignoring all the quantum issues. We're just assuming that it's just we're just measuring uh, along the x and y axes. So that's all that is. So there is going to be. Uh, so typically, we think of what we're trying to image as in continuous domain. The representation we get in the computer obviously is discrete. So we have to figure out how to go between those two domains. We're going to start with the discrete time uh, domain first because it's the simplest. And so we introduced what's called the Kronecker delta function, which is super simple. It's delta, and the, and the, not the notation here is we're using brackets. So it's equal to 1 when n equals 0, and it's 0 otherwise. And so here's what it looks like, delta of n. And then this is a shifted version. So this is now located at 2. Okay? So that's only equal to 1. When n equals 2, it's 0 everywhere else. We can also have two-dimensional Kronecker delta functions. So this is equal to 1 when m equals 0 and n equals 0. 0 otherwise, we can shift it around as we like. Okay. So why is that useful? Well, because that means that we can represent any arbitrary function as a weighted sum of these Kronecker delta functions. So for example, here, I've just drawn this function here. Um, let's see. So I think this is 1, minus 1, and 1 1.5. So given any arbitrary signal, in this case I just wrote down a, a bunch of numbers, I can represent that as it's a Kronecker delta at the origin multiplied by 1 plus a Kronecker delta at n minus, this is located at 1 now, okay? So it's like location 1 with an amplitude of minus 1, okay, plus a Kronecker delta shifted by 2. So this is now located at 2. So sorry, these, these coordinates are 0, 1, and 2. Okay. And so basically any function that I have, I can just break it up into a weighted sum of these Kronecker delta functions. Okay. So it's a fairly uh, straightforward concept, but it is the basis of what we're going to do. Similarly, for any 2D signal, I can take any 2D signal. In this case, there's A, B, C, and D are the values of my image. And I can just break that up into uh, a Kronecker delta with a weighting of A here, B here, C here, and D here. So the image on the left is just a sum of the images on the right. All right? So that's our very simple image decomposition. Uh, so in notation, it's just written like this. Basically, I have, uh, assuming that A is the origin, let's assume that this is at 0, 0, 
we just have A times the Kronecker delta at the origin plus B times the shifted Kronecker delta. So this is at 0, 1 in the, um, sorry, n minus 1. Okay, so let's see. Um, looks like I've, so I guess I've sort of, oh yeah, m and n. So in this case, the m coordinates are this way and the n coordinates are this way, I guess. Okay. Um, so C is here is equal to this guy here. So that's a coordinate 1, comma, 0. And this is a coordinate 1, comma, 1. Okay. Uh, and so we can write that as a double summation of each of those amplitudes, A, B, C, or D. So these are the A, B, Cs, or Ds. And these are just shifted delta functions. Okay, so the math is a little more scary than the actual image, but that's, that's how we represent it. So for example, this one we could write in signal expansion form. So for example, we could say that this is equal to 7 times delta of m n. Let's call this m and n. Um, oh, I know. So there is, yeah, so actually, um, before I go on, so... Um, the, um, when we deal with images, there's always sort of this, uh, and, and the, what you'll see is on some of the homeworks, we will assign MATLAB questions because we really want you to start working with images. So even on this very first homework, there will be a MATLAB, a very short MATLAB assignment to get you familiar with MATLAB. I know most people are familiar with MATLAB. If not, and you want an extra tutorial, please send email to the TAs and we can set up an extra tutorial session on MATLAB for those of you who want sort of more uh, introduction to it. But there, you know, MATLAB goes by rows and columns, okay? So uh, there's like rows and columns. And typically, you know, if I have X, you know, I'll have the row index by the column index, okay? Which is a little funky because typically we think of X and Y, okay? So that's where sort of this, so in this case, um, We'll just we, we, so there's always that potential confusion. So just if I if I get it wrong or you get it wrong, just at the end of the day, the image just has to look correct. Okay. So even when we do research, oftentimes it's like we just have to flip. At the end, we flip it here or there, or you know, there's always some place in the code that takes into account what MATLAB is doing. All right. Uh, but let's just let's just for this case ignore MATLAB and just assume that these are a coordinate system. Okay. So then we have plus eight times delta, this is shifted over by 1 on the m, so it's be m minus 1 comma n. Let's do the 5, plus 5 delta m minus 1, n minus 1, and so on and so forth. So basically the idea is you want to get comfortable with the idea that any image can be represented as just, essentially as pixel values at every location. So this is no different than what's done on your computer. So Kronecker Delta is super nice, super easy, um, and we're at the end of our time now. So uh, we'll stop here, and we'll pick up with Dirac Delta on Monday. All right? Um, so yeah, so just look for the homework. It'll be posted later today. Um,